All right, hello, welcome everybody. I am Dr. Jill Weiner. I am a uh, general internist, hospitalist turned meditation teacher and um, social justice and anti-racism um, seeker, enthusiast, someone I'm always trying to expand my knowledge um, of the world around me and, and what I can do to make the world a better place. And I'm doing this interview series on healthcare disparities in COVID. And I have Dr. Cindy Duke here with me, um, who is an OBGYN and specialist in reproductive endo endocrinology and infertility. And I'm going to let her tell me, um, Cindy, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And Thank if you, you for having me, Doc. I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> Cindy and I have been uh, interacting on the social medias for a very long time. So it's yeah. such a pleasure to see your, see your face and, and talk to you directly, uh, as directly as we can um, right now. <laughs> Given the time. But, yeah, that's true. So I'd love to know more about what you do. I know you do a lot of work eliminating disparities in healthcare access and delivery. So if you could share more about what it is that you do like professionally and in, in any other way. Yes. So, you know, yes, in my day job, I'm primarily a reproductive endocrine and infertility specialist, which means I'm working to help people get pregnant. But in the course of my training and my work, I definitely came along a number of cases where it became very apparent that there were disparities, even in how patients were accessing OBGYN care and definitely mm -hmm. in how patients were accessing infertility. And when I looked at it more carefully, it was not just that patients couldn't get into say an infertility clinic, but it was how they were treated, patients of different ethnic backgrounds, when mm. they showed up at the clinics, how they perceived the counseling delivered to them, and how they perceived the whole field in general as it relates to women of color. And so that was how my initial everyday job became one that integrated looking at disparity and eliminating it. And so some of the ways that I've looked to eliminate it include information delivery. How do I get information out there mm. to patients? How do I let patients know that there are voices of people who look like them within the field? Because for a very long time, a lot of patients didn't realize that reproductive endocrine and infertility had physicians who were of color, definitely mm -hmm. physicians who were female, as in my case, a black woman, definitely few people knew that we existed. And so that was the first, was letting people know there is representation within the field. But then being within the field also meant having to talk to your colleagues and let them know that this work is meaningful. Um, there are a number of people within the field who are doing that. And as we do more disparities research and more people look at how outcomes are different amongst different ethnic backgrounds. We've certainly now modified some of our care protocols. We've modified treatment protocols. Uh, many research uh, studies have become more inclusive um, because you can't really know how to help a medical condition if you're not studying the specific patient population. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we've been doing in the world of OBGYN, especially in infertility, has been extrapolation to women of other ethnic um, backgrounds. And we've definitely, as people have studied this, we now see that there are differences in how, say, women of Asian heritage, different Asian subgroups have different outcomes and worse outcomes with fertility treatments, for example. But I'm also a virologist by training. And so I have a PhD in virology, which means I spent a lot of years working on looking at viruses and how they interact with the human immune system. And so in this context of the COVID-19 pandemic, my interest peaked doubly because yeah. I was interested not only in the disease, but the virus, and then immediately started wondering what will happen to communities of color across the globe. Like while we were hearing about Wuhan and Italy, I started looking at what's happening in Africa. What are we hearing in Africa? And it of course led me to come across a number of social media things that were also unfortunately promoting mistruths like, oh, black people are immune. And immediately I started mobilizing my social media presence to let people know, listen, viruses do not discriminate and we need to get ready because we have other disparities in the black community, particularly in African American communities that actually are underlying conditions for this disease being really, really bad for us. And of course, as you know now, the data is coming forth showing us that indeed black communities are being hit very hard and it's really a 
culmination and constellation of all the different underlying disparities playing a role with a deadly virus mixed in. Yeah, well, that virology background is almost scarily like, like so relevant right now. It's that's so amazing that you're yeah. able to yes. bring that you know, it's in funny because well. my mom called and she's like, now I finally understand <laughs> why you got the PhD in virology. And I was like, Mom, that was 15 years ago. She's like, Yes, but I get it now. <laughs> Thanks for the vindication, mom. That's so funny. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, really? She didn't believe in me all this time. She was wondering what it was for. <laughs> so um, for people who are listening who aren't as familiar with, with maybe healthcare disparities um, and ways that, that our system, even before COVID, was uh, rigged against people of color in our country, um, particularly a, a lot of Black communities, can you share a little bit of background on that and then maybe go into how, how COVID has made that worse? Yes. So if we look at simple statistics in terms of disease incidence, communities of color, particularly Black communities, have very high rates of obesity and obesity-related illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure pressure, um, heart disease, kidney failure, um, asthma, because a lot of these are black communities are in urban centers that have a lot of you know, environmental pollution, mm -hmm. air pollution, which then predisposes kids and adults for more lung disorders. So just that alone increases their risk for developing really severe disease after a coronavirus infection, because of course, the virus causes an infection. The majority of us will not get very sick, but those who get sick, they develop COVID-19. And so that is the first thing. But why is it? Why do they seem to have higher rates of obesity and what we call lifestyle-related diseases? And it has to do with the fact that, again, in a lot of these urban centers, they have food deserts, meaning not very good access to nutritious food. Um, not Food desert meaning, you know, supermarkets aren't really in the neighborhood unless they leave and go, say, to the suburbs, etc. They don't really have access to food selections that are nutritious, etc. They also tend to not have much access to exercise facilities or ways to, you know, stay healthy and just get out there and get fit. Certainly in medicine, we've been encouraging everybody to move, get out there and move. Uh, Michelle Obama was doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And a part of that is because we know that a lot of these lifestyle illnesses can either be reversed or stopped if someone actually gets more active. But there are a constellation of reasons why people aren't able to work out as much. First, access, no city parks. Many of them don't really have parks. They have schools in neighborhoods that don't really have playgrounds, which is, you know, for a lot of people who live in the suburb, that sounds kind of like, really? But true. There are many urban schools that don't really have sporting facilities, um, or they may not even have sporting programs as part of their school program. So activity is an issue. Um, food access is an issue. Healthcare access is a huge issue. And healthcare access has multiple parts to it. So part is simply locating clinics and healthcare facilities in neighborhoods or within reach. But the other is having healthcare uh, financing. So insurance. Uh, in a lot of communities, you know, I trained in Baltimore, Maryland, and I trained at Johns Hopkins Hospital, which is a great hospital. But it was well known that 25% of the men who lived in the neighborhood immediately surrounding Johns Hopkins were unemployed, mm. which meant no access to good health care, if any, because they may have access to Medicaid, but again, there might be some issues with access and care if you have that sort of public insurance. And then, of course, in many communities of color, because of how we interacted with them historically as medicine, in terms of how we did research without telling them, how we mm -hmm. did, uh, we used their cells, like Henrietta Lacks, there's a lot of mistrust. You know, you think Tuskegee tried, or you think Henrietta Lacks. And so you put all that together, and you're less likely to find folks in these communities getting the same level of care, standard of care, that we've otherwise become used to delivering and expecting as patients. So really quickly for people watching who may not know about the Tuskegee trial and Henrietta Lacks, would you like to explain 
oh, a very sure. complicated subject in just a, just a, yeah. a little bit to so, explain to people. Henrietta Lacks about. was an African-American woman living in Baltimore, Maryland, who actually developed cervical cancer. Her the cancer of the neck of her uterus, basically. They discovered that the cells from her cancer were immortal, meaning you can culture them in a laboratory and they'll keep making new versions of themselves. As a result, those cells were used for a lot of research, including especially virology and immunology research in the world. So for example, I was using her cells before knowing her story. Mm -hmm. um, they're called HeLa cells for Henrietta and Lacks, HeLa. And so they're used for vaccine development. They've been used for so many studies in the world, yet the patient never knew, neither did her family ever know. And in so much as I love my alma mater, I am a proud Johns Hopkins uh, trainee, that was something that they had to come to terms with and eventually admit that they had been using her cells for decades without her family knowing at all what sort of contribution her cells had been used for, or even that she hadn't given consent. She was never told that yeah. this was or and being so compensated in some way for it because I, I read the a book about it and her yes. family was living in oh, abject, abject poverty, poverty yeah. right there in the Baltimore area right in those neighborhoods surrounding the hospital that I just mm -hmm. referenced and um you know, so that's the sort of thing that led to mistrust. The Tuskegee trial is a very famous one because it was really the United States' big study looking at syphilis. And what they were studying was whether or not if you treated syphilis with antibiotics, nowadays antibiotics are just commonplace conversations, but prior to 1930s, antibiotics were very novel and people didn't really know what treated what. And so they started treating a group of um, people in Tuskegee well, not study treating, they started studying them to see what was the outcome of a syphilis infection. Eventually, it was discovered that penicillin actually treated and cured syphilis. However, this particular group of patients were never told about it for decades. While everybody else in the United States, particularly people who were not black, were being treated with penicillin, this group of people were followed still to see how their disease progressed. And syphilis, by the way, most of us know it as a sexually transmitted infection, but it goes on to cause really bad systemic issues, including neurologic problems, dementia. And even though this was already well known, they were not availed the treatment. And so those are two very, very popular and contemporary today, but very much contemporary back then, mm -hmm. stories that sh demonstrated unfortunately, to people of color, that healthcare didn't value their lives in the same way. That is how they interpreted those yeah, stories. Absolutely. And so it leads to mistrust. It leads to mistrust. Yeah. And, the, and the, the people in the study were black men, is that? They were black men, correct. Yeah. They were black men in Tuskegee, Alabama. And even after knowing, now eventually the United States, the government, uh, the U.S. Health and Human Services apologized. Um, I think the first apologies really came out during the Clinton era, President Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. But that's how long it took. This was a study that started well before the civil rights era. Yeah. And that's, you know, it took about a half a century before a formal apology was me. Okay. So yeah, so this has been going on for a long time. And I think a lot of even healthcare professionals, we, we've heard of these things, but, but on a day-to-day -day interaction with patients, particularly for our black patients, we're like in our little educated bubbles and we don't really, we, we may sense some of that distrust, but I don't think that a lot of doctors Put the pieces together. Yes. From. You know, I think for a lot of people, it's it simply boils down to, oh, this is a racial interaction, especially if the mm -hmm. physician is one race and the patient is another yeah. race. The truth is, it's not just that, because even as a physician of color, I still have to contend with patients of color who don't trust me because I'm a physician. Sure. I may yeah. have to explain why. And that's the big thing that I have been talking to my colleagues about and I use my social media platforms, my writings, et cetera, and why I'm here too is to talk about that, which is we do have to make a concerted effort to get out there and let patients know we see the disparity. It's not enough to talk about it in our small circles, in our conferences, in our, our grand rounds, right? So our friends and colleagues who already understand what disparity means. What we need to do is the next step, which is to take 
practical steps following the identification of disparities and going to the people who have been the unfortunate victims of those disparities and saying, hey, we acknowledge there was a disparity and this is how we would like to fix it. And how do we fix it? We have to start by listening to them. So if you are dealing with a group of people who already don't trust you, you don't walk in and say, now here's my plan for you. They already don't trust you. Your mm. plan is going to fall on deaf ears. Instead, what you need to do is engage them and find out what it is in all this time that led to the disparity in the first place. And how can I help you? correct the disparity. It takes time to close gaps and disparities. We all know this, but until we start listening to, instead of talking to, talking at them, we won't make much change. Right. Yeah. That's such a good point. So, so turning to COVID specifically a little bit more, because I, I had this in my notes as something I wanted to talk to you about was the distrust of, of medical advice within, within Black communities Mm-hmm. Not all, not all of them, but certainly, as you're saying, that's something that 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 persists. How do you think that's, or do you think that has played into where where some of the statistics that we're seeing now are yes. great, greatly, you know, increased risk mm-hmm. of death for uh, Black people uh, here in the mm-hmm. U.S. Um, higher risk of getting even sicker. There are actually examples of it. So, you know, unfortunately, we have these underlying health disparities. Absolutely. We have underlying issues with food access, et cetera. But there are people who also peddle misinformation or are aware of these disparities and they're aware of this mistrust. And so it's easy to build on the mistrust, right? Which was, for example, while we were hearing the conversations about social distancing, physical distancing, in communities of color. And if you search the internet and you look at, say, what we call Black Twitter, you were seeing tweets, you were seeing stories, you were seeing um, people forwarding messages that said, this is just another form of segregation, Mm. right? Be careful. This is what they did. This is how they segregate us further. So unfortunately, if you're someone with that mistrust, if you're someone with that historical reference to segregation, historical reference to redlining, et cetera, you may take this as an opportunity to protest. And so we saw many communities where people continue to defy the recommendations for physical distancing, they were still congregating, having block parties, having um, events, you know, so you have that. But we also, if we're being honest, Jill, there are many people in power who also were giving mixed messaging. And so depending on where they were listening, they got a lot of misinformation that For example, like I said, it was a really big thing, the story that was being promoted, which is Black people are immune to the virus. There were people saying, look at Africa. The numbers in Africa aren't high. It's because, you know, Black people are immune. Of course, that's not true. There are countries in Africa that are hard hit, but part of it is also our misinformation about Africa. People think of Africa as one collective, while it's a country of, it's a, continent of 51 countries but we talk about it like it's one city and it's Mm -hmm. not so some countries were doing great uh, and many countries in Africa which we don't realize here because unfortunately we didn't even do it in many countries in Africa they do a really rigorous infectious disease screen when you arrive in country at the airport we don't really do that here Mm -hmm. And so they were able to screen and quarantine in many of those countries early on, while we were still very lax with what we were doing at our own airports. Um, But there are other countries in Africa, for example, South Africa, which is one of the larger countries on the African continent, has been hard hit. And they're seeing some of these disparities as well in the what they call the slums or the ghettos of um, Cape Town, et cetera. But no, that wasn't the part of the information that was being shared. It was simply, hey, look at Africa. The numbers are low. Ergo, Black people are immune. So that also meant that physical distancing, many people assume that meant, sure, it's for everybody else, not for Black people. Mm. We can congregate because we have immunity, look at Africa. And that of course is not true for so many reasons. Um, It's also not true because even genetically we're not identical to people on the African continent. There's been a lot of racial mixing in the United States if we were to go into genetics. But just aside from that, our underlying disease profiles are different. And that's why now 
we're seeing, you know, in some places, black people are dying six to one. For every one death of a non-black person um, from COVID-19 in some cities, six black people have died. We're seeing if you just take race out of it and simply look at disease, we know that someone who's diabetic, type two, well controlled or not so well controlled even, they're six times more likely to die from COVID-19 than someone who doesn't have underlying diabetes. That's huge. Because we've been telling everyone that the mortality rate from coronavirus infection slash COVID-19 is between one and 3%. But the truth is for people with hypertension, diabetes, lung disease, like, you know, asthma, COPD, it's six to 10% mortality. It's huge. So yeah, so that's a huge difference. And I, it's, I'm so enjoying these conversations I'm having because, you know, you read some stuff in, in, in what I think are hopefully reputable um, news organizations, but there's always more aspects no more aspects that, 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 that aren't being re reported on. And mm -hmm. you just taught me mm -hmm. so much um, and, and stuff that, that makes sense, but, but it isn't really being brought to light by, yes. by the news. So what, what do you think? Cause I think right now what I'm seeing and, and what I've felt a lot myself is that I'm in this place of privilege and I am being ordered to stay in my house and mm -hmm. it is very stressful to think about the world out there and how hard mm -hmm. it is and mm -hmm. all the things that have changed and things in my life that have been canceled. But ultimately like I've got a very lovely existence yes. during, even during mm -hmm. this time, mm -hmm. but it, we're also mentally stretched and I'm not practicing medicine right now. So I don't even yes. have that to think about. Mm -hmm. We're also though anyway, mentally stretched that it's hard to think, it almost recoiling from thinking about life outside. Yes. Because we're all yeah. going through our own struggles. Yeah, yeah for I feel like of color, it's different because for many of them, they have to keep going outside. Right. They have right. to keep going to work. Many of them are living paycheck to paycheck, if even, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they can't afford to stay home. For many of them, if they don't go to work, there's no there's no um, sick leave. Right. They don't right. have sick. Leave. But even if they felt sick, they're going to work. Even yeah. if they so, you know, it's not just that they defied physical distancing orders either. I want to make that clear. Right. Yeah. But for many of them, they had no choice. They need to work to keep food on the table. They need to work to keep a roof over their heads. Yeah, they no need to work that. to keep their kids, you know fairly safe. And so for that reason, while many of us, like we, I was quickly able to convert my medical practice to a telemedicine practice and still see patients and thus still earn income while I'm sitting at home. I'm still able to interact with friends and family this way. I'm using virtual. Many uh, poor communities around the United States, including communities of color, you know, the internet is still a luxury. Mm -hmm. for a lot of these families. Many of us don't realize that. So even education for their children, many people are doing homeschooling right now. Well, for many of these communities, they don't have time to do homeschooling because they still have to work, but they also may not have access to the virtual tools for homeschooling because they don't have home internet, et cetera. It's shocking to hear, but you know, there are statistics that let us know that a lot of people in this United States are still living in abject poverty. And there are still somewhere between 10 to 20% of our children who go to sleep hungry every night. So for people, there's almost like two worlds, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the case anyway, which, sure. which a lot of people don't realize, but mm -hmm. I think people in, who have a certain amount of privilege or have the privilege also shutting their brains down to that if, yes. if they want to. And I'm, I'm guilty. Psychic of numbing, right? We call it psychic numbing, which is yeah. the ability to just shut out what you don't, you don't expect to be healthy for you, eventually you do psychic numbing. And I actually just wrote an article about that because I think there's a collective psychic numbing that has hit us in this country. It's a coping mechanism, but unfortunately it's one that breeds misinformation because we yeah. numb ourselves to the truth of the reality that we're living yeah, in. Absolutely. So for, for people who do now start to come out of their little like stress shells yeah. and, and want to help and want to, be active in some way, but they're stuck in their houses. Yes. What can, what can people like me do? What can other mm -hmm. people who are maybe, um, you know, in different circumstances than me, but still wanting to do something, raise awareness, help. 
what can we do not being able to leave our houses? Are there things that people can do to make a difference? Well, I think, you know, the first is because we're all at home, we can write to our representatives to let them know that we're maybe if you're living someplace and you're like, I did not know there was this disparity right here where I live, right? Um, because I was talking to a friend who said, you know, I really, I knew Chicago had crime. Those were her words. But I didn't realize Chicago had that many sick people. I didn't realize, she was like, everywhere I drive, I see health centers. I see federally qualified health centers. Mm -hmm. Who knew? And so I think if you're finally this, it's no fault. It doesn't mean that you've ignored things or that you're somehow biased inside. We've, we've all been living. We've been living. If you haven't seen it, now's the time, if you're alerted to it now and you're concerned, now's the time to write to your representatives. Uh, for some of us, the representatives are in our family. It's, now's a good time to say to them, hey, what's going on with these numbers and what can we do to change it? That's one way. Other ways would be you can have more direct impact. So you can reach out to your local food banks and ask them which communities seem to be underserved and how can I help? How can I maybe sponsor food? How can I sponsor toiletry? There are many communities where women right now can't even afford feminine hygiene products. And that's These even women, before COVID, right? I mean, that's before been... Before COVID. Yeah. And so you couple that now with many of them losing their jobs, with a huge paper supply shortage going on, including feminine napkins. A lot of... Um, stores don't have it but also you have communities where they they actually have listened and they're staying home but again they were living in a food slash shopping desert so they don't have access to these things so there are lots of grassroots and community organizations and i'm happy to send them to you jill that you can share as well you can yeah them, share them um to that you can contact and say how do i get involved how do i help um there are some people who have access or have the ability to build uh laptops computers tablets that you can help bring to certain communities to help people access virtual health um, and virtual care uh you know many communities they're still very much reliant on their uh, religious organizations. So reaching out to find out what you can do to help via their trusted organization is one way. Um, you know, you may not necessarily identify with their religious belief, but at this point, it's more what is it that they're bringing to the community. If you can vet them, you can verify that they're actually doing some good. That's mm -hmm. one way to um, get involved. The other way quite honestly, is simply spreading what you know amongst your friends and peers who may also not know about this, right? Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And knowledge is eventually what's going to change policy. It's what's going to drive how we do things like vote, how we elect people to run city councils, people who sit on school boards, people who sit on the boards of hospitals and healthcare um, entities. It's not just about, you know, the big elections either. So I think that's important to talk about too. Okay, great. Those are really helpful. And anything you can send me, I'll put in the, um, the, the notes for the show that'll, yeah. that'll go on YouTube. Um, how can people, thank you, You've been amazing, and I, I could keep talking to you for eight hours, but we'll, we yes. pro probably should end the interview at some point. Um, can you tell people how to find you, what you're up to? Um, I know sure. I, I think you have a podcast, all sorts of other stuff. So, so do, um, do. What, what do you want people to know about you and the work that you're doing? And well, I think the you? easiest way to find me is to go to my website, which is drcindyduke.com. And it shows all the different things I do from my clinical work to my advocacy work. You know, I have my own foundation aimed at eliminating disparities. It's called Girl Powered Success and Survival International. It's a foundation. And from it, I also have the podcast that's sprang up from it too. But the whole goal of it is actually to reach out to communities, particularly communities of color around the world and empowering young women and women who are intent on going back to their own communities to help. And so, for example, my foundation has a scholarship where we fund, for many women, what we don't know in our country, in the United States, many people get scholarships and it's nice. They may get a scholarship to a university to attend a conference, but they still don't have the means to attend, to buy the ticket, to come, mm -hmm. or the hotel to stay, or if they're coming for school, they may get a lovely free ride at a university, but housing usually isn't included in that. And so the 
foundation's mission is to fund that side that isn't funded. And so if someone, maybe they get to travel to a conference in another country where they can learn some skill sets to bring back to build their community, our scholarship is intended to help fund that trip, the housing, et cetera. Um, and that's my podcast as well. It's aimed at showcasing women from every background. So we don't just show women of color. We show women from every background who have found a way to do amazing things in their lives. And it's not so much to talk about what is your job today in the podcast, but how did you get there? You know, what I'm finding is there are some themes to how women succeed and but also it's nice for other people to hear that because when we're living through our tumultuous moments in our lives it feels so lonely that yeah. it's good to hear oh Jill Wiener did had this too and this is what she did with it you know or so and so became a pilot but it was a similar experience to what I have today mm -hmm. I can do that you know I talked to one woman who's a contractor and another who's an architect and you hear their stories and how they chose paths and it's tremendous to hear it. That's so, it's, I love that. That's wonderful. I um, can't wait to check that out and, and to share that. And you're on social media too. I'll put that information. Yes, yes. Um, you can yeah. find me on all uh, social media channels at Dr. Cindy M. Duke. So Dr. Cindy M. is Mary Duke. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Pinterest. <laughs> oh, Pinterest. I haven't gotten into that one yet. It's like, it's the yes. one online, but I've heard that it's kind of awesome. It's pretty awesome just for the things you can learn. But if you're also a person who's blogging or writing articles, Pinterest, a lot of people use Pinterest as a way to find different blogs and topics. Okay, good to know. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cindy Duke. This has been so amazing and, and uh, educational and you are doing an amazing job at what you're doing. Thank you for doing the work that you do. And um, yeah. I feel Thank like we just scratched this area. Thank oh, you so of course, much. of course. It, it feels like a very natural um, intersection of, of two yes. passions of mine. So um, thank you for being a part of it. And um, uh, maybe we'll do a part two because I feel like there's, there's more. <laughs> there's it's more to talk about. COVID's going to be around for a while. So yes. It is. All right. Well, thank you so much.